Well, you can take off that last one of Father Gary, but <laughs> the rest of it. Um, so when they were designing the space, they, they realized they wanted to have a choir or Newman was, uh, was an oratorian. He, he founded, um, or he was involved in the founding of uh, St. Philip's Oratory in Birmingham. And he was hoping that he would also be able to have an oratory, uh, a group of oratorians here. And one of the ways in which they, they, they pray and worship together is by singing. Um, and so the idea was at first, I believe, that this balcony, though very, very skinny, <laughs> would um, hold the oratorians. And it's got a very high screen. We can't tell from here, but the ground level is actually quite far below where this gold screen is. Um, and so they would be completely um, secluded in, and invisible. You wouldn't see them, which I think in, musically would have made something very fascinating, a very fascinating thing to experience. Um, but um, I don't believe it was used at all. Um, and even when Pollen is writing letters, um, Later on, he's writing letters with the, the chaplain to, to design the porch, which doesn't come about until, like, uh, I think, 1878. It's still unused. And one of the reasons why I think, too, was because they wanted an organ and it wouldn't fit there. Uh, it would only fit in the, the, the gallery above. And so they made, um, I, I don't know if people can see it, but maybe when you come down here later and look up, there is a screened area on the balcony here that was made uh, for the choir later on. Um, so that came much later after the, the church was built. But yes, this was at first intended to be a choir balcony and close to the altar so that um, yeah, they could see and pray. I, I find that very interesting, especially the dialogue between the past and present, because I suppose we're now in 2022 and 2006 has become part of the historic fabric. I would love to see, um, you know, a photographic study done of the original canvases, because they are still present in the church, they're, they're, they're upstairs, um, to kind of record their particular aesthetics. Um, and it disappoints me a little bit that the, the, the Levant Tunzer ones very much connect back to the Raphael cartoons rather than connecting back to aesthetically what had taken place um, here. Yes. If Rome will have them. <laughs> yeah, that's. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. In, in defense of the current one, uh, <laughs> there were three major examinations of, of the paintings over a 50 yeah. to 60 year period. Yeah. Each time was uh, coming to that they're not really salvageable. Now there is, there has been at Hampstead Heath uh, a similar kind of problem and they did do recovery of some very significant paintings at some extreme cost. It is a question whether they were actually repainted or not, and essentially. And then, what, what, how much, how much money do you put into uh, a, what is essentially not a very good painting? So, not not in terms of what its effect is in the church and all of that. That's a whole different question. Yeah. But they're not actually all of that. Uh, they're not. They're not that good to begin with. They're, yeah. They were meant to be viewed that far away. Yeah. yeah. The windows um, were placed up, up at such a height because Pollen was interested in how much light he could bring into such a small site in Dublin city centre. Um, and all of them are glazed in what we call bull's eyes, so it looks like the end of a glass bottle. It would have been very, very cheap to make. Uh, another kind of sidestep from uh, the Gothic of the time, which was to, to, to fill all the windows with colour and stained glass. But Pollen was of the opinion that, that would, that's distracting. We don't need to be calling attention up here. We need to be calling people's attention to, to here and to what's happening in, in the paintings below. And he decided to light from both sides and at such a height so that the light will, will gently come down. And I know you've spoken before about your love for how the dappled lighting you can see um, 
coming down onto the paintings um, over time. Obviously, we're in November, so we don't have any light. Um, and all of this side um, were, I believe, conserved recently, um, a couple of years ago. And uh, he does, I don't know how many thousands there are um, of bullseyes, but it, they are just so simple and so beautiful. And again, another example of a very humble approach to decorating with what they have, um, but still trying for that like, very lovely and mysterious quality. I, I think I said to Father Gary when he first asked me, you know, I'm going to say all the things I don't like. <laughs> um, and, you know, when I first went about researching, I was like looking at each of the capels and thinking none of them match, none of them are the same height, none of them are the same width. You can tell almost the individuality of each craftsman working on them. Um, the, the kind of the way in which nothing really matches was the thing that, that bothered me the most. Um, but over time, I think that's the thing that has ended up making me enjoy it even more, um, how each of the, the capitals aren't necessarily matching and that that's a reflection of the individual craftsmen um, as well. Like even directly behind you, Sammy, the column that you have behind you has some lovely um, uh, designs on the top of the capital that aren't present on any of the other capitals in that art. They decided to have these little dentures in it and I don't know, maybe they decided it didn't look good so they didn't apply it to any of the other ones. <laughs> and it's just little moments like that that I think make this church special. It's the kind of, yeah, it's the humble approach, I suppose, to, to, to the craft. Um, and then I know as well, I think some people's favourites are, and I never mentioned them, but these lovely um, columns that are, that kind of turn these lunettes into a kind of arcade, have these lovely bas relief capitals on them. And I would invite you to do, to, to do a, a procession <laughs> through the church because um, as you come down the side aisles here, the story of the bird changes in the capital. And so they are themselves t telling a little bit of a story. Um, and so, yeah, there are a lot of very wonderful and very disconnected and unmatching details in this church, and I think is one of the reasons why I, ended, I, I, I like it so much. Yeah. I don't, unfortunately. That's a, I love that connection. Um, this is a, a, a baldacchino. Um, we would, this would also be uh, a baldacchino, and then sometimes we, we see them in church designs as um, freestanding sculptures that have four columns and then a, a kind of a, a canopy. So the St. Peter's in Rome has a baldacchino. These are all different types of baldacchinos. Um, and in terms of inspiration for the design, the only references in Pollen's letters I could find about them was you know, whether or not the weight of wood of this one would be held up well enough with these two columns, but no real, um, yeah, discussion on, on any inspiration in terms of motif, but I really love your idea of the beehives, especially, I, I never noticed until you said the lovely, like, hexagons that there are up here in this design. Um, I do know that when it first w was being constructed, it didn't have the domes, and as it was like being assembled here, Pollen said that won't do to just have this one flat shelf um, protruding over the altar. And so the, the domes were a very late addition. And in the letters, that, that, um, that uh, picture of the, the small sketch of this in late October is because he's, he's writing to Newman to say, I've decided to change my mind. And, and he, he seems to do that quite often. He'll come in, he'll see the work that's done and say, actually, can we change it to this instead? And he does that with the screens and he does that a few other times. He very much sees the whole building project as this kind of reflexive and an adaptable um, process. And he doesn't care that it's already made or, or, or already stuck on the wall. He'll ask for it to be changed to, to, to fit his. Uh, Newman was the, the founding rector of the university and as such he decided that what he needed for a Catholic university at its centre was a chapel. 
um, a place specifically that not only could be a place to preach and to obviously gather together and have mass, but also be a place where um, the students could come and graduate out of. So he saw it very much as a place that was um, both for the ritual of the faith, as well as kind of slightly more civic community qualities of graduating from a university. Um, and he wanted a space that could hold enough people and, and do that do that well. Um, and so I suppose it's in his kind of capacity as the founder and um, rector that he was able to, to do that. Um, and the money, um, <laughs> He had some money, um, and again, I'm not a Newman scholar, and I'm sure there are many people here who can tell the story better than I can, but uh, Newman had some money that um, had been given to him, um, subscribers from all over the world, really, to assist him in a, a law trial he was a part of. Um, um, he had been, I believe, um, sued um, for blasphemy, I believe, no, Lavelle? Information. Information. Defamation, a defamation suit, and he um, needed help in that cr the famous trial, the Achille trial, and people from all over supported him through that, and he had an excess kitty of money from that, and decided to apply that to here. Um, he got some money from individual donors, one man donated money, and he decided to use it um, as all of it for the, the marble of the altar, so if, if that donor hadn't come forward, the rest of the altar would probably be wood also. <laughs> um, and then um, a lovely lady also came forward and gave money towards the, the painting specifically. Um, and everything else he went into debt personally to fund. Um, and there's a really lovely letter that I have here that he's, him, himself and Pollen are, are writing about the money problems. And it's, it's essentially a list of items. He, he, he has this alabaster altar rail and he wants to add alabaster uh, rails along behind the, the, the um, arches here because there's a, there's a short one just like on either side here. He wanted to have one going back but he said I, I have no money for that so put a curtain there. Um, and he also realized that um, he wanted to have some marble on the altar. He had no money for that. So it's just a list of 14 things and he just says dispense with it each time. Um, and that um, the marble works on the apse were, were, were so costly that they had to stop doing other things in the building in order to, um, to finish. And one of, the, one of the choices they had to make was, do we put marble on the, on the floor here on the altar or do we, do we put marble on the back of the, um, the vertical part of the altar here? They had finished the, the side parts, um, but not the back with all of the um, little precious stones in it. Um, and they had to make a choice whether to finish that in the kind of painted wood marble or put marble on the floor. And they decided to, to put marble. I think it's a good decision. They decided to put marble on, on the back of the altar, but very much the whole process was a give and take in that sort of way. Um, and yeah, it, I think it was supposed to. It was supposed to cost about three thousand pounds to begin with, and ended up costing um, just about six thousand pounds. So, so, tw so twice the amount. Um, and um, yeah, he, it took him about ten years to, to come back out of that date, uh, out of that debt, and the university eventually bought the land and bought the, the church from him, and so he was able to make, make even more. <laughs>